Good afternoon, or is it evening? Um, so, you're probably wondering why you've got a surgeon come to talk to you about bleeding. Um, I've been um, a interested in this for a number of years. Um, clearly, if you're dealing with a, uh, a trauma patient, uh, lots of them, if they are going to die, they're going to die of bleeding, and just trying to understand how we can actually um, treat them better and, and result in better outcomes. Um, so I did a PhD in um, acute traumatic coagulopathy about 10 years ago, um, and then I've been working at um, Queen Mary University of London um, with Kareem Brohi for, for um, the subsequent period after that. So is it a big problem? It is a really big problem. Um, there's not many things in medicine where you deal with such a high case fatality rate. So this is the most up-to-date data that we have on bleeding and trauma. Um, this was a, um, a centre study of 22 centres um, that um, we collected basically a snapshot data of what was happening to patients and trying to work out what sort of transfusions they were getting. And we split this into those that got the traditional definition of a, a major transfusion, 10 units or more, and then four more units. And half your patients, if they are bleeding and need those blood volumes, will die within the first year. And much of that mortality clearly happens very early on within the first 24 hours. Um, so it's a big problem. Um, clearly, the trauma patients are mostly young, although that demographic is changing. And one of the things that came out of this study was this, that actually your rates of massive transfusion um, were much higher in those that were over 65. We're not sure why. There's clearly a number of reasons why that might be the case. Actually, is it the medicines that they're on? Is it their response to trauma is very different? Or is it actually that they are hiding the major hemorrhage that's happening and we are just slow at picking up um, treatment for these patients and therefore we're not actually giving them the same level of care as we should do? So there's lots of questions um, to be asked. But it's not all bad news. Um, actually, if you look at, this is data from the Royal London Hospital, if you look at our how we're managing these patients and the mortality rates have actually been slowly falling over the last 10 years or so. Um, and we've actually shown a two third reduction in 24 hour mortality for those that are activating our massive hemorrhage protocol, or as we call it, the Royal London, the code red. And part of this is because actually um, the way we're transfusing them is completely changed. So the incidence of massive transfusion is actually falling. But that is because we have changed our protocols and we're delivering things much more earlier we get on top of bleeding quicker clearly surgery and interventional radiology has a part to play in this um, but overall blood use is falling um, quite significantly so what actually is trauma-induced coagulopathy now you probably have an idea about what it is um, part of if i use my surgical brain this is what it is so it is a huge mess in theater where you have blood that's pouring over the sides of the abdomen there is so much blood, it's going into your shoes, it's going into your wellies or whatever it is you're wearing. And whatever it is the anaesthetist is trying to put in, it's just coming out the other side. But to be a bit more scientific, there's actually probably two things that are driving trauma-induced coagulopathy. So there's something very early that happens the moment the patient is hit by the bus or falls off the um, ladder or is um, um, stabbed. And there's something else that's going on that we are doing, the anaesthetists are doing, that's a resuscitation related coagulopathy. Um, now the resuscitation related coagulopathy used to be the thing that everyone says was the problem. And primarily it's because we were giving too much of this stuff, too much crystalloid, too much of things that don't carry any oxygen carrying capacity and don't carry any clotting factors. But crystalloid use has just gone out of you know, practice now. If you are seen by an emergency physician either at the roadside or in hospital, they will not be reaching for crystalloid anymore. The, the, the volumes of use are very, very small. So that's, that's, that's not an issue. But what is the issue then? Well, if we think of the types of patients that would be at risk of developing trauma-induced coagulopathy, we'll just walk through this slide. So, prothrombin time up the side, injury severity score, it's an anatomical composite scoring system, basically tells you how badly bashed up you are, and then base deficit a marker of shock. So there's a couple of extremes on this graph. So if you take someone that's very injured, they've broken a few legs, um, they're not bleeding, their coagulation is not deranged. Take somebody who is not that injured, but they're shocked, so they're bleeding, someone that's been stabbed in the popliteal artery, they've lost quite a bit of blood, 
um, but there's not a lot of it tissue injury, their coagulation is slightly deranged. This group here that have shock, tissue hyperperfusion, and tissue injury are the patients that are at risk. These are the ones that have um, deranged coagulation. So classically, this is someone with big pelvic fracture, you know, lots of blunt force injury, and they've lost a lot of blood from either internal um, iliac bleeding or, or somewhere else in the abdomen. So those are the patients that are, are the, the risk for um, you know, bleeding that's very difficult to control surgically. But also it's on a continuum of time. So you have something which is termed acute traumatic coagulopathy that happens very early on. As the patient is going through their clinical pathway, there is an attempt at resuscitating the patient. Now this has the opportunity to either make things better if you're um, resuscitating them properly or actually adding to the problem. But then at some point, and this is all vague because we don't know where these times are, and in some patients it will be different, they are going to move into a prothrombotic phase, which brings with it a whole load of other problems to manage in the intensive care unit if the patient survives that initial insult. So what's actually driving that whole process? Well, if I were to give this talk 15 years ago, I would have put up this slide and said it's that. It's the lethal triad, the bloody vicious circle. This is true to some extent, but lots of these things no longer apply because we don't dilute the patients now. We don't give them lots of crystalloid. We are much better at keeping the patient warm. Now, clearly, they will become more acidotic because they're becoming shocked, which is going to cause dysfunction for the clotting proteins. But this idea of consumption, this is not correct. There is no DIC. This is not DIC. They are completely different. Um, and I can't go into all of the details, but clotting factors do not fall to very low levels. There is no microvascular thrombi in these patients. DIC is a different entity. Trauma-induced coagulopathy is very different. Um, now, part of our understanding is because, you know, we've moved on now. So this idea of um, um, the classical pathways, to some extent, is, you know, consigned to the history books because we understand that coagulation is just a very small part of the inflammatory response, which makes sense because inflammation around a blood vessel is part of clotting and that's what's important to try to arrest the hemorrhage on a very on a small level but you see the key players within inflammation are very important clearly in coagulation as well so thrombin five and, and um, fibrin this is all what's going on you know in the in the way that the body is trying to form the clot but clearly the endothelium is so important in all of this difficult to study the endothelium but um, there's been some work recently in the trauma community that's looked at this in a bit more detail. Um, and remember what's on the endothelium, the glycocalyx, a very um, um, coagulant, um, or sorry, anticoagulant carpet, which if cleaved off in shock, as happens, that is now floating around in the system. Um, and it's causing all sorts of chaos to the already difficult situation that is um, presented on the endothelium itself. Just to show you some um, data around what a patient with ATC looks like versus non-ATC. So this was actually data that was part of my PhD. So we measured blood samples as soon as the patient hit the door. So as soon as the trauma patient came into the Royal London. Um, and you'll look at, so those with craigalopathy and those without. There's a couple of things that stand out. So first of all, they are making lots of thrombin. Prothrombin fragments, one and two are four times higher, okay? So thrombin is not, is, is not, the, not, the, not an issue. So why do you give FFP? We'll come on to that. Fibrinogen, however, falls. It falls very quickly. This is within two hours of injury, and already you're at critical levels, okay? Lysis, hugely activated in these patients. D-dimers and plasma and plasma levels really, really high but also this activated protein C, very high as well. And if you look at the clotting factors themselves, bar factor five, remember activated protein C is high, very similar, there's hardly any difference. Certainly not at the levels you'd expect them to be causing a problem. So as I said before, TIC is not 
DIC, different, different entities. But what is important is clot strength rather than clot initiation. As I said, the thrombin that's around is, is huge. It's not an issue in terms of you actually getting the whole process started. But looking at this viscoelastic trace, it's the strength, the amplitude of the clot that is the problem. Um, remember, your amplitude of the clot is determined largely by platelets and fibrinogen components, which we'll discuss um, at the end of the talk. But putting this together, what do we think is actually going on? So in the endothelium here, and a platelet. So platelets are clearly the, the centre of the clotting universe. Everything has to happen on the surface of a platelet. All the clotting factors will assemble ultimately to, to drive thrombin and cleave your fibrinogen. But in the presence of shock, the endothelium is activated. It will express thrombomodulin, which will, does what it's supposed to do. It modulates thrombin. So it will pull thrombin away from its normal role of um, cleaving fibrinogen. But it also will activate protein C, this complex here. Activated protein C will chew up factor V and factor VIII. So I showed you the factor V falls and factor VIII as an acute phase reactant actually goes up. But if you look at the ratios overall, it will come down. Um, so you can't really make a make sensible, strong clot. But this aspect here is probably even more important, is that activated protein C releases the break on fibrin lysis because it consumes Pi1. So it will allow um, TPA to do its job and then you'll get unregulated fibrin lysis. And remember, this is happening systemically. Now, probably that makes sense for this to happen on a local basis, because otherwise, when you make you form a clot, you just you know, continue to clot everywhere. So you're, you, you're keeping the clot localised. But systemically, when you have someone with major trauma, this is what we think is driving the whole process, or certainly an important part um, of trauma-induced coagulopathy. But it's even more complicated than that. So we've tried to do some very complex um, analysis. This is um, hierarchical clustering. So what you do is you put in all of the, um, your variables. So this is all the clotting factors and, and ly lysis markers down the side here. And then you plug it into the program. And you just ask it to look for patterns. And you'll see patterns that are red are low, and patterns that, sorry, patterns that are red are yeah, low, and patterns that are blue are high. So, these, so you're not asking it to look at any, um, or you're not saying to the algorithm to say, based on their injury, based on their shock, how do they cluster together? It's what patterns have actually emerged based on the um, different variables within the system. And you'll get, and what happens, so this is thousands of patients and thousands of data points, is that a few important clusters um, start to fall out of this, and um, where you'll see that so up here, this is protein C and antithrombin, so these are low, but then your elements down here, these are lysis markers, and um, these are very, very high. So this is a very lytic group here, and then you'll have other groups that are predominantly hypercoagulable. So there are different phenotypes that are actually occurring in somebody who's got trauma-induced coagulopathy. And once you've then done that with those different clusters here, you can then go back and look at clinically what those phenotypes or phenotypes isn't the right word, or what that, those patterns actually uh, mean. So in, in pattern seven, you see the mortality is much, much higher, and certainly five, six, seven, and eight, um, those are the patients that do very badly. And then you can look at their transfusion requirements, much higher in those groups. If you then look at um, their clotting um, processes, their fibrinogen is very low, but yet their prothrombin fragments are very, very high. And then you look at the activated protein C and D dimer levels. So the APC is very high and they're very, very lytic, those patients. So putting that some sort of sense to, you know, take that away, what, that, what does that actually mean? So you need to have two important drivers for trauma-induced coagulopathy. Tissue injury and tissue hyperperfusion. And the activated protein C is, is very important in this that will bring these two things together. But individually, tissue injury will activate a whole load of things anyway, because you'll produce fibrin, you'll activate fibrin lysis. And shock itself, if you take the extreme example of just pure shock, someone in cardiac arrest and you measure um, their coagulation 
um, markers afterwards, they are very fibrolytic and their platelets don't work. So you put the two together, it's no wonder that you have a tremendous effect on coagulation. And this happens very early. So before the patient even arrives in hospital, they will have this. And then the resuscitation related elements of resuscitating them badly, allowing them to get cold, allowing them to get more shocked, will feed into a more global derangement that is happening during the resuscitation phase. And this is what we, we determine as trauma-induced coagulopathy. So I know what that patient may look like just by, at the end of the bed, this patient that I'll be worried about. Because if they've got severe injury and they're shocked, that's going to set alarm bells off to me. But how, if you're in the lab, how do you work out, really, is that patient um, at risk of TIC or not? It's difficult, isn't it? Because there are a number of things you're trying to measure in this global system of coagulation. And there's a number of things inside the patient that are going to impact on all of these things. And if you omit one of these, you're going to miss something that is driving a very important process. So the idea of having a clotting screen seems a bit nonsensical now because you send it to the lab and then the first thing, you know, you're going to chuck away the platelets, spin it down and chuck away the platelets. So you don't know anything about platelets in the beginning. So that's um, a bit of an issue. And obviously the time it takes to give you a result. Bearing in mind, in a level one transfusion, you can be transfusing units and units, you know, within a minute. So whatever result the lab can give me, that might be 10, 20 units of blood or plasma down the line. So it's historical. It, does, it doesn't mean anything. The other important thing is the definition. So if you were going to use a, a um, prothrombin time to tell you, should this be some, should there, is this somebody that's really, really sick or not? Classically, people have said 1.5 times normal. If I'm doing an elective list, the anaesthetist will say, no, you can't do that because the INR is greater than 1.5. I mean, it's rubbish. There's no evidence. It doesn't mean anything. So just to show you why it doesn't mean anything, 5,000 patients in this study looking at prothrombin ratio versus mortality. So you would, you'd imagine if 1.5 meant anything, that actually all the patients less than 1.5 would be fine. And anyone 1.5 or more would be bad. But actually, as soon as your ratio starts to become abnormal, your mortality starts to climb. So it's an abnormal prothrombin ratio is the issue, not an arbitrary 1.5 times normal. And that same thing applies when you look at more, um, red cells and FFP. The stepwise or the step change occurs as soon as it's abnormal, not at 1.5 times normal. And that's important because if you were to use that old definition, you'd be missing 15% of patients who you know are much more likely to die and to need much more on blood products. So you could say, well, why don't you use a point of care test? I mean, they're around, aren't they? They're you know, used for little old ladies measuring their warfarin at home. The problem with it, um, if it's normal, the correlation is good. But as soon as it becomes abnormal, greater than 1.2, correlation is lost and probably it's to do with hematocrit because when the hematocrit's low in your bleeding trauma patient the variability starts to increase so you can't use it so most people now have moved towards viscoelastic testing um, it's been around obviously for a, a number of years you know since 1945 I think it was invented um, it's important for lots of reasons one you can wheel it around and you can do it do the test next to the patient in the resuscitation room, in theatre, in a little satellite lab, wherever you want. But it's the amount of information you get within the first 10 minutes that's important. Because you can start to now guide therapy or have an appreciation of if you're winning or not with the resuscitation that you're giving. Because all of this information is available very early on um, in that first stage. And now, particularly with the cartridge form tests, so TEG and Rotem have both got um, cartridgeized versions, is that it's really foolproof, um, rather than having to pipette and do all these different steps. Um, it's very, very useful. And as I said, it's, you get lots of information in the first five minutes. And you can see, even if we, without actually looking at numbers, the traces look very different. And you know if someone has got um, a flat trace, you know, this is somebody that needs more. Um, fibrinogen platelets, if this is prolonged, then you probably need to give a bit more FFP. The other thing about these is that it's really the only test that's, that's um, available in a usable time frame for fibrinolysis. 
Um, unless you want to measure your plasma and antiplasma and wait six hours, you, you can't in a trauma patient, clearly. But it does give you some idea about fibrinolysis. But even still, fibrinolysis <coughs> classically takes around half an hour. It's a long time to wait in a trauma patient's bleeding. If you see this, fulminant hyperfibrinolysis, that game is up. This is associated with about 85 to 90% mortality. This is probably just sort of the patient dying rather than um, what's actually going on. Why is it so important? Well, the CRASH-2 trial, um, you know, for, uh, it's important to just take a moment to think how important this trial is in, in the trauma community. I mean, it's a massive study of over 20,000 patients. Um, and to date, one of the most successful trials in, in trauma resuscitation, because it asked a very simple question, you know, give tranosamic acid, does it make you live or die in a trauma patient? And clearly, giving it versus placebo, if you give it within the first three hours, patients do better. But if you give it after three hours, you're actually killing your patient. Now, I can't think of many drugs which have such a difference in action based on time. So there's a lot that we don't understand around fibrinolysis. Um, assuming you are giving it um, within three hours, the, the most recent paper in The Lancet shows actually you need to be giving it very, very early because you are losing the benefit of it the longer you wait. Um, and the groups that benefit most, those with severe shock. Um, so the simple answer is give it. But it still remains a very, very controversial drug, believe it or not. If I were to give this talk in America, people would be heckling and telling me that it's the CRASH-2 was a ridiculous study, it wasn't done in mature trauma systems, patients treated differently, it's not relevant to our, our practice. And there are still a number of studies going on looking at tranosamic acid in the US and Australia to try to tease out whether or not it has the same benefit in their systems. And part of it was because the, the reason with CRASH-2, they say we didn't measure anything around mechanism, we didn't look at clotting, um, and so they were concerned. So what we did was have a little closer look at this um, to try to understand why, if you look at Rotem trace in trauma patients, very few patients are actually fibrinolytic. Um, in actual fact, those that, so fibrinolysis is defined as greater than 15% on Rotem. Um, most of your patients, 85% of your patients, are not fibrinolytic. So we looked at the gold standard, we looked at plasma and antiplasma and separated them into three groups. So those that definitely were fibrinolytic, gold standard and on Rotem, they were severe group. Definitely not fibrinolytic, both test negative, and then the, the moderate group. So you're not seeing it on Rotem, but they are fibrinolytic, their plasma and antiplasma levels are high. And lo and behold, most of your patients are actually fibrinolytic. Your Rotem test just doesn't pick them up. And that's the same for TEG. It's actually a very insensitive test for fibrinolysis. And if you look at the more extreme end, so patients with high injury severity scores, <coughs> it's almost universal. Most of your patients are actually fibrinolytic. So giving it to patients would make absolute sense because they're all fibrinolytic. Just moving on now to platelets. Um, platelets are obviously very difficult to study in an, uh, an acute um, situation. But really our knowledge around platelets is so small is so small. We really don't understand what they do. When we give them to the patients, we don't understand what they do, and we don't understand you know, their role within inflammation and coagulation, but clearly they're important to both. Some of the things that we do understand, um, the platelet function falls, and it stays low for a while. Um, this is looking at multi-plate, um, just hours down here. So it's, it, the platelet function falls within the first hours, but then it stays low for a couple of days. Um, if your platelet function is low, you're much more likely to die. Platelet counts, interestingly, don't fall usually to critical levels. But this was the most intriguing thing. This is the data that we published last year. So this was looking at um, platelet aggregation on multi-plate, and then we measured patients' um, aggregation during their bleeding episode. So after four units, eight units, and 12 units. And we separated them into groups that got platelets and those that didn't. Now you would assume by giving platelets, you would be restoring some platelet function. You are exactly the same as a patient that doesn't get platelets. So what the hell are platelets doing? Because they don't restore your platelet count either. So why do we give platelets? We don't know. 
Well, maybe, because playlists have obviously got loads of things within them, haven't they? Um, and Pi 1 is something that platelets contain a lot of. Um, so we looked at those that got red cells and plasma and those that got red cells, plasma and platelets and looked at them at the start of the interval and at the end of the interval within those four unit intervals. And you see that actually there's much more Pi 1 that's measured in the serum, uh, measured in the plasma of these patients. Which is another explanation for why one of the biggest studies, the Lutra transfusion, the proper study, which was giving lots of platelets as well as um, plasma, looking at different ratios, that there was an improved outcome in those that got more platelets. So potentially it's another mechanism for treating fibrinolysis. So the other side of fibrinolysis, so fibrinogen, um, and actually making the clot itself, we know that fibrinogen is very important. It's the substrate of the clot. It would make sense. And that if your levels fall to low, you know, fall very low, with, um, your mortality climbs very quickly. In your bleeding patient, there's some bad things going on, which are going to differentially affect fibrinogen metabolism, both in breakdown and also um, how quickly it can start to, you know, to synthesize itself. So this got us thinking on, you know, maybe we should just give more of fibrinogen to our bleeding patients. And this was the cryostat one study. So what we did was just randomize patients. It's a small pilot study that we did with Oxford, um, with Nikki Curry and Simon Stanworth. So patients either got standard of care, so a one-to-one -one ratio of um, red cells, plasma, platelets, and cryo. And in the cryo arm, we just gave them two units of cryo up front. Obviously, it was a slight delay to call a thorit, um, but we said we need to give this as soon as we can as a trauma patient. And we measured, again, at four unit intervals. In the standard arm, you see fibrinogen levels fall to around one by the time you've given eight units. And obviously, you give cryo earlier, you give more of it, you can keep the fibrinogen levels up. No surprise there. But the biggest surprise was actually the strong signal to mortality benefit. So in the cryo arm, mortality was 18% less. Small study, it wasn't powerful mortality, um, but it, it was enough data for us to say we need to take this seriously. And so we've gone on now and launched the Cryostat 2 study, which is a national, well, it's an international study actually, but all the MTCs in England, a couple of the big centres in Wales and Scotland, and then five centres in the US, recruiting to this 1,500 patient study. Same protocol, but we're giving three units of cryo up front, um, and it's powered for mortality. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll be able to report um, some positive findings. Um, the other thing to mention is blood itself. Um, a couple of air ambulances now are actually giving red blood cells. Some are actually giving red blood cells and plasma. Um, it would make sense that giving red blood cells actually would improve your mortality because better than giving crystalloid. And also, the quicker you reverse shock, the quicker you can start to reverse some of those things that are driving trauma-induced coagulopathy. So you are paying the oxygen debt um, much quicker. And looking at data from the London Air Ambulance, it's been quite impressive, the reduction in mortality since they've been carrying red blood cells. Um, but it has presented a new problem for us in hospital in that, so this is looking at, so this is the same graph I showed you at the beginning, this is 24 hour mortality and the black bars are three hour mortality. And you would have noticed that at that point there, there was a spike in our mortalities at 24 hours. So what was, what's happened is that the patients that were dying at the side of the road are now coming to hospital and are actually dying in hospital. So we're being presented with a whole new different group of patients that we have to get better at in terms of resuscitating, treating them surgically, etc. But you'll see that that 3 m mortality is now starting to come down because we've got better at really treating aggressively these patients. Because some of these patients would have actually been in cardiac arrest, they'd have got some blood, they've then got a return of an output and then come into hospital. So clearly a very challenging group of patients. Just to sort of finish up now on a few of the other trials that are out there. Um, the refill trial is, um, uh, a trial that's um, looking at actually giving red blood cells in the um, pre-hospital phase versus placebo. It's actually red blood cells and lyoplas. Um, it struggled to recruit, um, but there's a, there's a couple of other um, air ambulances that are recruiting. Um, it's um, centred in 
sent it in Birmingham. Um, just on the subject of lyoplas, there's lots of work that's been done, particularly in Europe and now in the States, looking at different forms of um, concentrates. And it's, as we talk, I was talking before the session, that um, lots of the things that we do in, in trauma practice, not, not just trauma practice, but you know, our understanding of things, is something that actually has been known about for a long time. We've just forgotten it. You know, this is a guy in Second World War that's drawing up Laflar's plasma, and then it went out of fashion. Um, and now we're having to relearn all of those steps again. But certainly the, the um, Europeans use a lot of it, the French um, um, and the Dutch, um, most of their blood banks are actually moving towards this. So in terms of fibrinogen concentrates, um, we've done a small study again with Oxford looking at um, fibrinogen concentrate in trauma patients. This was the EFIT study which is the results going to be released soon. The Feisty study, another one um, used a similar sort of method. Um, trauma patients recruited in the emergency department, given fibrinogen concentrate. Problem with it is very expensive still, about four or five times the price of cryo, which is why we went down the arm, uh, down the route of cryo. Um, and one of the things that people have been interested in is actually, can you truly guide therapy if you have a product that is available instantly. Because if you have a Rotem test, great, I've got my answer within five, 10 minutes, phone up the lab, okay, give me some cryo, it's gonna take you know 25 minutes to get that. If you've got something on the shelf that you can reconstitute, then you could administer it straight away. And so you truly are you know, treating based on what you're seeing on the, on the Rotem or the TEG. Um, and the Europeans suggest that you can. So we're testing this now in a clinical trial. It's called the iTactic study. Um, Tactic is a, is a um, research program funded by the um, European Union. Obviously, pre-Brexit, we can't, can't get any more money now. Um, but it's a, it's a randomized controlled trial looking at conventional coagulation tests to guide therapy versus Rotem tests. And the algorithm um, it's very straightforward to follow um, in that, you know, if you've got a problem with your clotting times, then you're going to give plasma. If it's a problem with platelets, uh, sorry, if it's a problem with amplitude, then you're going to give platelets or fibrinogen. And so that this will be finishing uh, at some point this year. But I just want to finish on the topic which is close to my heart, and that is whole blood. So a couple of years ago, if you said to the blood bank, yeah, we want to start giving whole blood, they'd look at you like you were mad. Um, but things have moved on, I'm pleased to report, so much in the last five years that actually later on this year we should be starting a study with the London Air Ambulance, hopefully looking at whole blood on the Air Ambulance. NHSBT makes whole blood, but what it makes actually is red blood cells suspended in plasma because the filter to remove the white cells also strips out the platelets. But it's still something better than components. And again, if you go back in history, not very far, in um, Vietnam and Korea, the Americans used millions of units of cold, whole blood. In the most recent conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, warm whole blood was used. I mean, clearly in civilian practice, warm whole blood is not going to be practical. But cold whole blood was used in large volumes. And it's important to understand what it is you're giving if you're re, um, fra giving fractionated products to a patient because... Um, this is what the bags are, this is what they all contain. Um, great in principle, but when you mix them all up and give them to a patient, you end up with a hypercoagulable, anemic um, and thrombocytopenic solution, which is no good to a bleeding trauma patient. And part of this is because blood banks are not designed for bleeding patients. Blood banks are designed for oncology patients and getting the most out of what you have. Because um, you would want to give your oncology patient just platelets on their own. A bleeding patient, you actually need to give them whole blood, that's what they're bleeding. So you need to, so I think, you know, the time has come to have some sensible discussions around, can we actually have blood banks for a bleeding patient? Because their demands are very different to um, the rest of the hospital. Um, so we've touched on, um, actually whole blood in terms of the playlist. And th there are filters actually available in the US which actually retain the platelets in the circulation. So they take the white cells out, but they keep the platelets in. 
So this is something that's not CE marked in, in the UK yet, but something that we're looking at. So just to finish, um, acute traumatic coagulopathy kills a lot of patients, contributes to the death of lots of patients, and it occurs very early. By the time you first see a patient in the emergency room, if they are in that risk group, big injury and lots of bleeding, they will have ATC. And we have an opportunity to make them better by resuscitating them well, by giving them blood and blood products up front, <coughs> reversing shock, having the, the hospital activate its system so you can deliver damage control surgery early. But be mindful that very soon they will develop developing a prothrombotic phase. And maybe if you're giving your TXA here, that's not that helpful. But any, this is, you know, scheme, every patient is going to be different on this continuum. And just to remember that coagulation is just a very small part of inflammation. And early on, when you're dealing with your hypercoagulation and bleeding, that they are going to flip over into this problem we see on intensive care in the survivors when they are hypercoagulable. They've got multi-organ failure. Um, and this thing is probably just driven by the early activation of coagulation, which is just the earliest phase of the inflammatory response. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks.